Thank you very much for swiftly coming back. I hope you had a good break. Um, we're now looking at UNESCO City of Film um, and the importance of film and cinemas to cities. Um, we have with us today Karen Merkel, UK National Commission for UNESCO, and Natalie Moore from Bristol, UNESCO City of Film. We're going to discuss city cinema, film, and why Bristol's UNESCO City of Film status is so important for the city. Um, would you welcome Natalie and Karen? Andrew. Hello everyone, my name is Natalie Moore. I manage Bristol's UNESCO City of Film designation in the city. I also wear another hat which is managing Bristol Film Office, which is all about facilitating filming in Bristol. And I'm delighted to welcome Karen Merkel here to Bristol. Karen um, is from the UK Commission for UNESCO and I've wanted to bring UNESCO here for some time to, talk, to make the connection really between UNESCO, Bristol, cities. And we're going to talk about those connections today. Um, so, Karen, I thought I would start by asking you to introduce yourself and give us a bit of information about your role with UNESCO yes. and how it connects to UNESCO as a whole. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, what, a, what a fantastic event this is being, and I hope I can contribute something useful to it. Um, I'm a non-executive director on the UK's National Commission for UNESCO, and my portfolio actually is communication and information, but I did a bit of land grabbing and asked if I could also um, have an insight and overview of the Creative Cities programme because I've done a lot of work in the arena professionally and I'm extremely interested. The culture brief is very big and so I've been able to um, merge the two interests. But let me just go up a level and just explain for those of you that don't know um, a little bit about UNESCO. It's huge um, and not entirely understood always. It's 75 years old this year and it was formed out of the Second World War, a ravaged world, and its founders actually met here in London and said, we've got to do something different. And they came up with this mission, which is to build peace into the minds of men and women through harnessing the power of education, science, and culture. And they also tagged on a whole piece about economic development, about sustainability. They knew then that if people are living in poverty, they're very unlikely to be able to get on very well. And it's very, very interesting when you go back and look at UNESCO's documents, how many of them are still extraordinarily relevant now. And UNESCO really does believe its mission and insist on it being delivered. So every member state of UNESCO, all nations are entitled to be member states. They have to pay their dues and live up to the values. <laughs> but anyway, Every member state has a national commission and they vary in sizes. Probably won't surprise you to think that Germany has the largest national commission and is the greatest donor to UNESCO coming out of Second World War, a body dedicated to peace. It would be Germany, who's second? Japan. Very interesting stuff around all of that. Um, the UK's national commission is now quite small, small and perfectly formed. Um, it has a very small staff team, five, who work like crazy and are entirely wonderful. And it has a board of non-execs, of whom I'm one. And we each mirror the major programs, education, science, and culture. So that's sort of the background. The Creative Cities program um, is becoming more and more central to UNESCO delivering its values. And I think maybe it's time for you to say a little <laughs> no, no, piece. Sure. So uh, the UNESCO Creative Cities Network is what Bristol entered into when it became a creative city of film. Um, there are seven creative fields that you can bid to um, specialise in, in the network, um, film being one, but there are also others. I'll, I'll forget them all, but there's music, literature, gastronomy is one, there are, and there are, there are others Design. as well. Design, Design yeah. craft and folk arts. Yeah. So, there, and there are, I think there are 246 cities on the network currently um, all over the world and uh, 18 cities of film currently around the world uh, 
they range from you know Bristol to uh, Sydney in Australia, Rome, Santos Brazil, uh, Galway in Ireland. There are they're, they're, they span all over the world. Um, and the aim of the network is to collaborate internationally, to to forge links with those cities internationally, but also to um, embed uh, culture and creative industries into local po policy as well, so so that those that that sector can become more sustainable for the long term, and take on UNESCO's values as as much as possible. Um, and you know, it's those it's those values as a, as a whole for cities that become so um, so important because in trying to build, you know, we were listening to Lynn earlier talking about the, the value of the yeah. sector um, and, and Steve and, uh, and Andrew as well and the growth of the sector and, and being able to harness uh, that growth and be able to, to give something back to the city becomes so important and that's where UNESCO really plays a, an important role. I think the, it, there's the, um, UNESCO dedicated to the Sustainable Development Goals, which you may or may not know about, but they were ad adopted after the Millennium Development Goals. And there's one area in particular, um, well, there's two really. One is Education for All, which UNESCO created. Um, and it, it has a very, very close connection for and to the Creative Cities Programme. Um, and the other is, I think, I, I'm going to try and read a little bit for you, which is the 2016 um, New Urban Agenda, because I think it sort of speaks to it, which was, it highlights the linkages between sustainable urbanisation and job creation, livelihood opportunities and improved quality of life. And it, assist, it insists on incorporation of all these sectors in every urban development or renewal policy and strategy. And it then, for UNESCO, gives the framing for what it considers to be very important, which is intangible cultural heritage. And there are, I don't think there are any other agencies <laughs> that have a sort of global perspective that are actually interested in the intangible. And of course, that's very much the space in which film operates. And I think I've been sort of trying to look a little bit more about Bristol from a long way away and been really intrigued about the things that I know about it and what I've found out. And you are in effect like a perfect UNESCO city because <laughs> you've been, you know, you've been um, the world, you'd have been a green city, was it twice? You were the first city of cycling and um, you've got all these qualities. You're very, very, very old. You are one of the <laughs> oldest cities in the UK. So you've got this fantastic heritage. There's sort of very little that I can't find and probably not known by everybody here, but maybe you are also a UNESCO a city of learning. It's very unusual for cities to have two designations. They're not easy to get. You have to no. do a, a hell of a lot of work. I know that Lynn, who spoke earlier, is very familiar with that. It can take, if you want to be a World Heritage Site, it can take up to 10 years to get the accreditation. And actually, it isn't quite the case that you have the status for life. As a creative city, you are monitored. You have to deliver. It's quite, it's more pressurized than it would seem. This person mm -hmm. here who appears to be so calm, actually there's a lot of stuff that you've got to deliver. It's not, it isn't something that you just have and keep. So they're precious to have. And one more thing, then I can stop on the UNESCO stuff. Um, UNESCO is not a donor. UNESCO does not give grants. So you do all this work and you don't get any money. What? It, it is quite astounding, but what it is, is this hallmark. It's a stamp which says you are going to embody these values and they are going to be done at an excellent level. And the hallmark is extremely precious. And I think one of the things it liberates is a spirit of collaboration between UNESCO designations, anyone who's got an accredited project will know that the other organization is going to be singing the same song. You may be wildly different in scale, in ambition, and all of those things, but you are going to have the same mission at heart, which means that you really can work with another creative city of film 
or another creative city. I know you're not going to be competing for that precious money. What you will probably be doing is doing a joint piece of work to get some money. And that's, that really does make a difference, I think. Yeah, and, and I think sort of going, talking to Lynn's point earlier um, around the national, national bodies and national, the money sitting at a national level, um, and Bristol being able to sort of get its hands on, on that money to, and the need to get on its hands on that money. Um, that UNESCO gives us the opportunity, having the name attached, gives us the opportunity to forge partnerships with national, national um, organisations, with industry, um, to then hopefully bring some more money to the, to the city, uh, specifically around film. But what we're interested in doing with the UNESCO designation is connecting the film industry to education um, schemes, to um, schemes that uh, enable skills, that enable talent development, that, that but build a sustainable future for the people in the city and to make it meaningful. I remember I had a conversation, it was with Penny Evans at Noel West Media Centre when we first got the designation, and she said to me, you have to make it meaningful. You have to make it meaningful, and it's always stuck with me that we, you know, that bringing that, making sure that it gives something back to the city and connect, making the connection between this huge global behemoth of UNESCO and Bristol and the people living in Bristol is, is fundamental to that designation. I have to get, just give a shout to Charlotte Crofts, who's here as well, who was instrumental in Bristol, I mean, who, who, who made sure we got the City of Film status. So um, I have to just give credit to her as well. Um, yeah, big, big round of applause to Charlotte. We're going to talk about the, the issue about urbanisation, mm. um, which is coming upon us all, really. I, mean, this, I don't know how many of you are interested in the stats around it, but in a sort of nerdy way, I've been quite interested to follow it for a while. And they are very scary um, in the sense that in by 2030, 60% of the world's population, it's agreed, will be living in an urban area. And by 2050, 70%. That's an awful lot of people living in areas that are urban. And of course, those areas may not be urban at the moment. In other words, the urban sprawl that we describe is spreading all over the world. People from time, time immemorial have moved for work. They need to eat. They will always do that. And now, of course, we know that people are moving because the land isn't sustaining them anymore. We can't live in areas that we used to live in. And that's happening here in the UK, is it not? We're experiencing more flooding. If you live in coastal areas, your house might drop off the cliff. It, we've got really those real problems. And how you manage the social cohesion when you've got more and more and more people living in greater density is, is probably going to be one of our greatest challenge alongside the thing that's going to be discussed in Glasgow very quickly. I, I think that this program, probably the two, the city of learning status and the creative city combined, will be something that will give a really good leverage for Bristol to enable you to go, oh yeah, we've got, haven't you got 90 languages spoken in Bristol? You've got a really rich, rich community or sets of communities to be working with and through and to build those understandings because that's the way you live peaceably if you know who each other is. I, I think you're well placed to do it. I don't know if that's being Pollyanna in terms of feeling optimistic, but I don't think I could say that about every city in the UK. It doesn't feel like that here to me. No, and I think it's I think it's quite a challenge. It's quite a challenge to to build to sort of take that that ethos and build it into policy. Um, not because it's not there. You know, the, the aims that for UN for Bristol, UNESCO aims it really well, as you say, with the the aspirations for the city. Um, but how you actually make sure that film that that culture sits uh, writ large within within policy is, is quite a challenge in itself, and I've certainly found that over the last four years of managing the designation to actually bring it to the forefront, um, exactly as Lynn was talking about as well, is is a big challenge. So I, I think I think the opportunities for people to become involved in the story making, the storytelling of Bristol, of their lives, of other lives, of fantasized lives that they're all real, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And I, I would love it if you would share with people 
the um, schemes that you're creating along with Lynn, I believe, around the, the new training opportunities for people. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of, yes, yeah. I, please let's just have time for this one. I think it's the most inspirational <laughs> partnership of any that I've heard for ages, truly. Yeah, no pressure. Um, so uh, the, one, of the, one of the big assets for Bristol um, that those people will know about is the Bottle Yard Studios, which sits in South Bristol. Um, and there are pockets of South Bristol that are, have areas of extreme deprivation. And it's something that um, I've been very conscious of as a, a, as a film officer for the city. We're encouraging productions to Bristol all the time. We see you know, 12 million in the last year of inward investment from drama production in the city. Um, how do we make sure that that investment is going to, into Bristol? How do we make sure that people in Bristol are benefiting from that investment? So um, the, the, what we've tried to do with the Bottle Yard, because the Bottle Yard is a local authority facility, which is fairly unusual for, for uh, production studios, and uh, that comes with its challenges, but it also comes with quite a lot of benefits because it means that we can position it as an asset for, um, for urban regeneration. And the aim with the Bottle Yard in the future is to um, connect with, is to collaborate with FE colleges in the area, with uh, community organisations that know South Bristol better than I ever could and, and a lot of the people working in the studio ever could, um, and make those connections and, and build work experience programmes into the, the studio itself, but also working with national partners, um, with screen skills, with uh, with various hopeful <laughs> potentially funders but also with industry bodies like Netflix hopefully with Channel 4 making sure that there are tangible opportunities for, pe for people to train uh, at the studio and not in not in standard necessarily what you would consider to be standard um, options it could be construction it could be hair and makeup it could be um, a whole you know el 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 electricians um, it's taking those transferable skills and making them a reality in the film and TV sector so that's that's the aim uh, with the with the studio and um as i say it's for you know we're fortunate that we can use it in that way because it is a, a local authority facility um and we just yeah yeah we're, that's what we're aiming for it's pretty neat isn't it so yeah are you ready for us to stop <laughs> <laughs> we can carry on chat. there's another four minutes <laughs> Right, what haven't we covered? Um, well, whether there are any, if anybody has any questions, we, we could take questions. If, yes, that's true, that would be good. Charlotte? Does anybody have, yeah, um, Charlotte, I'm, I'm trying to find where the roving, oh, here's the roving mic, sorry. <laughs> I don't know whether to take, can you hear me through my mask? Yeah. Um, I'm keeping it on because I've got a school-aged child and I don't want to... Um, contribute to the rise in cases in Bristol. Um, my question's about um, sustainable filmmaking and green filmmaking, um, which I think is perhaps the next thing that we really need to be focusing on with the climate catastrophe that's happening at the moment. And I know there's a green team at the Bottle Yard and it's something that Bristol takes very seriously. Um, so I just wanted if you could speak to that both as Bristol but also as UNESCO about how filmmaking, both what's on screen and how we make films can contribute to kind of the solution sure. okay. let me go yeah. first because I have less to say on this because actually I don't UNESCO doesn't think in that way I don't think which is one of the disappointing things about the UN family is they do tend to work in their um, big slow ways where we we're doing this we don't cross over with that we're doing that I, I think what they would actually say is that's very, very important and that's for the creative cities of film to do. I don't think they would see it as a UNESCO. UNESCO is not operational like that. Um, however, I do think it's a really interesting and important point and I will raise it because there's a UNESCO general conference in November and I'll see if I can talk with our science team um, and see if there's any ways in which there can be some sort of proposal. So thank you. It's a, it's a really good point because it will cross over for everything. Thank you. Yep. But it, it is high on the agenda for Cities of Film and it's something that other cities are, are sort of leading the way in to a certain extent. But also where we're looking to national partners for, to progress that in the area as well. So we're, we're looking at, um, to BAFTA, Albert, to make sure that we can secure a partnership with them hopefully in the future and then to build up a, a network from there and a, a regional 
a regional network that would um, support sustainable filmmaking in the future. So it's, it's, on the, it's on the radar, it's on the action plan for um, City of Film over the next four years. It's worth saying the next session that follows is all about this subject, so we'll be um, <coughs> discussing that next Great. Are there notes. any other questions, uh, any quick questions that you have? Can I ask you one question? What do you think about the idea of the Bristol Media Summit that we're all being forced into doing now, I think? <laughs> I, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's do it. That sounds great. <laughs> okay, well... Natalie will be joining our final panel as well to talk about UNESCO City Film in the future, so uh, we'll be welcoming her back soon. Uh, thank you very much, thank Karen you. and Natalie, for the session. Thank you for having thank me. You. Thank you. I think with the you know the, the rapidly urbanising world is one of the key subjects for our work, and um, and I think given the figures that you've heard today, the um, Mark's ambition for five cinemas in each city needs to be independent. In, independent cinemas needs to be increased, I think, with the large uh, urbanization that's taking place. So we need to, uh, to, to increase your ambition, Mark. Um, before we move on to the next session, uh, Rich is here, and we're going to show the final of the, the third of the three films that we commissioned, um, short films that we commissioned, and Rich is just going to introduce them now. Hi again, everyone. Um, yeah, the final film uh, of the fr trilogy of films we made, uh, we've, we commissioned, uh, was by Theo Watkins, uh, another local filmmaker. Uh, it's called Same Stuff. Thank you. I've got to watch my ego doesn't trip over itself. The ego is a funny thing. I've been doing it lately just as a meditation practice of going out and looking up. It's quite interesting. Because the majority of the time we walk around looking down at me. I'm in recovery from addiction. Uh, five years now. I've had a very, very colourful life. In order to explain that feeling of being in that, in that place, I wore my feet out in a blur, you know. I didn't care whether I lived or died, to be honest with you, and that's what I treated myself like I did. woke up now, everything's awake, you know, even though I've lived in Bristol all my life, it's, it's still brand new to me now. Take more time, more moments to enjoy things that are around me, even though it's the same, same stuff, but it's through different eyes, you now through sober eyes. Is Theo in the room? Oh, there's Theo. Give Theo another round of applause. Thank you. So those... Thank you, Theo. Though those three films were commissioned as part of the National Lottery Heritage Fund project. We, we are grateful to them for supporting them and grateful to Rich for taking, um, supporting us and leading us through that 
process. We're now moving on to making film sustainable, and this is about both filmmaking and also festivals. And it's going to be chaired by Jenny Lay, so you all um, hand over to introduce the guests. So thank you, Jenny. Frown at me and I'll know when to stop. Um, perfect. So, um, hi, uh, and uh, this is, I think, going to be a really interesting session. We're talking about making films sustainable. I'm Jenny Lacey, uh, and we have Andy Clare with us, who is director of production for Icon Films. We have Lucy Muir, who's the chief executive of Wildscreen, which is why we're talking about exhibitions as well. Um, and we've also got Christina Turner, who's the co-founder of Filmmakers for Future colon wildlife, that's the right way, it's hard to say, but um, what they're each going to do is talk a little bit about what they've been thinking about, doing, putting into practice, uh, and, and plans they have for the future for, for a little while, and I hope that, uh, that we will then have a group discussion, but I hope that very quickly you'll join in and ask questions, uh, and, and maybe talk about the things that you're doing too. So welcome to the three of you, and Andy, we, we're doing this alphabetically, so Andy, if you'd like to start. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Icon Films is an independent production company that's been working and delivering content out of Bristol for 30 years now. Um, we have been committed to um, sustainable production for quite a long time. You've already heard mention of Albert, which I think we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but we've been working with Albert since 2013 to um, measure the impact of the activities of all our productions. A lot of the productions that we make um, are filmed overseas, uh, which presents us with all sorts of challenges in terms of the carbon impact of those. Um, over time, we have um, developed many strategies within the company and uh, how we ensure that we are um, em embedding in the culture of the company, that sustainability is is at, at the heart of everything that we do. We, on, on arrival into the business, we talk to everybody, um, brief them on our expectations and the best practices in the building and in all the operations. And then each individual production will assess the uh, potential impact and then work together as a team to um, consider and implement how we can reduce that impact. Um, we make sure that sustainability is on the agenda um, of every meeting, just to make sure that all our decision making has some, some consideration. We've also found um, that our efforts to um, consider well-being of all the people that work at ICON has very much merged with our green team on certain levels, uh, especially as we increasingly find people with environmental anxiety um, choosing to come and work with us. Um, and then each of our departments also has their own consideration, so our development department will be very engaged with ensuring that um, environmental sustainable messages are included in there, the development of ideas and the way that they're presented, whether it's directly an environmental programme or not. Um, what else do we do? Um, yeah, I'll talk about Albert later. Is that what yeah, you were hoping for, Jenny? Um, so, yeah, so I'm CEO of Wildscreen. So Wildscreen is an environmental charity um, and we were started in Bristol back in 1982. So um, we were created by um, basically the founders of the BBC Natural History Unit. So the industry is at the heart of our charity, but we're very much environmental. So, um, you know, we, we work closely with the industry, but at the back of my mind, I'm always thinking about our impact. So in, we do lots of kind of public outreach and, and that kind of stuff, but today I'm gonna to talk about um, how we help the industry. So there's kind of three main ways that we try and nudge or challenge the industry to kind of do better in terms of their production. So ourselves, we run the world's biggest wildlife environmental film festival every other year here in Bristol. Um, a festival has a huge environmental impact. So you know, I have real guilt or <laughs> anxiety about the impact of bringing, you know, over 100, uh, sorry, 1,000 filmmakers from over 42 countries to Bristol for a week. You know, the impact of that is huge. 
Um, I think the pandemic, you know, one of the silver linings has been that technology and perhaps people's appetite for joining us virtually has increased quite a lot. So I'm really looking forward to our next festival next October, you know, how we can continue to make the festival accessible to more people internationally whilst also reducing our impact. So when we're, you know, at the moment we're looking at how we deliver that festival, you know, it's all about measuring our impact, you know, making sure our venues tell us exactly how much electricity we're using, you know, the virtual impact of the festival, we also need to be measuring. So though people aren't flying, they're using the internet, which has its own impact. So we need to be measuring that. Um, and where possible, we try and avoid offsetting because that, isn't a solution. What we actually want to do is reduce our environmental impact. So it's a real challenge for live events, um, but it's something that we're really looking into and, and measuring, and we should be leading the way in that in terms of festivals. So we go to lots of um, other organisations and festivals that are running events to see how they are reducing their impact, not just offsetting. Um, for us, for the past couple of festivals, you know, people love to meet people in person. You know, while screen is a marketplace, people buy and sell films. They want to have that one-to-one -one contact. Um, so, you know, that, that's a real challenge for us and, and how we tackle that. So we've tried the kind of nudge effect of asking people to offset their travel. But to be really honest, hardly anyone does it, to be really honest. Um, so this time what we're looking at doing is actually incorporating it into the ticket price. So rather than nudging people to do it, we're going to force everyone that physically comes to our festival to offset. Um, and that's a big decision for a charity to make because it's, you know, there's a big financial implication of that, but we need to be leading, leading the way in that. Um, at the festival itself, editorially, we've always made sure that we talk about sustainable filmmaking. You know, we really want to give a platform to impact production. So, um, you know, People love natural history films. In Bristol, it brings in 32% of the turnover. You know, it's a really important economically. I think we're now moving to a time where <coughs> the films have to have action. So yes, everybody wants to look at the natural world and enjoy it. It's given us real respite during the pandemic, but those films and productions really need to be driving action and behavior change. So we really want to give a platform to those, those filmmakers and storytellers who are incorporating that from the very beginning of their production and, and that's something that we're talking to you um, and Christina and her her team about um, as well because you know it, it's all very well helping people fall in love with the natural world but then what and that's the piece of the puzzle that I think we as an industry need, really need to work on and that's where I feel wildscreen has got a really unique role um, and then the, the third thing that we do is um, we have Panda Awards so for the, the international wildlife filmmaking industry their their version of the Green Oscars so it's your peers saying you've made the best film in the past two years um, so last festival, we actually created a sustainable panda award where we asked every single filmmaker, what did you do to reduce the environmental impact of your film? Now, only half of our entrants, or our kind of 750 entrants, actually answered that question. And I'd say about a third really did anything I would say was game changing. Um, you know, it was all, you know, we had vegetarian meals, we used, you know, uh, reusable bottles, but we need to be talking bigger than that. Um, so we actually took a very brave decision, well actually my chair did, Laura Marshall, who's in the audience last year, um, to not award anyone in our industry the Sustainable Panda Award because we didn't feel like the industry was doing enough. Um, so this year we are going to have a Sustainable Panda Award, we're working with Christina and her team and hopefully Albert Bafta as well, to actually develop a point system. So you know, really challenging the industry on what are you doing? So it's not just about offsetting, that is, that is the last resort. You know, how can you use in-country talent more rather than flying people, you know, to the other side of the world to tell somebody else's story about their nature, their local nature? How can you use local talent, um, you know, all the way from development, production, post-production? What's happening across that whole journey in terms of your reducing your impact as a production? And, you know, for us, you know, COP's happening, we're in a biodiversity crisis as well. We should be leading the way that the natural history industry in terms of reducing our, our impact and being more sustainable in our filmmaking. And that's what Wellspring's role is to kind of really challenge and show the industry how they can work, you know, to, to, to create a more sustainable film industry from an environmental perspective. Great, Lucy, thanks. Christina? Thanks. Um, Yes, so Filmmakers for Future Wildlife, or FFW, which is much easier to say, um, we are uh, a community, an online community, um, grassroots, volunteer-led, 
and we're basically made up of filmmakers, wildlife filmmakers, that would like our industry to be doing more, basically, to help in the current climate and ecological crisis. Um, so we have two main aims. So one is to encourage collaboration across our industry on reducing our footprint, and one is to make more impactful content to help inspire change. Um, so obviously we make our living from from wildlife and wild places, and there's there's a growing number of us who feel like we should be doing more, and we wanted to explore our options basically. So we set up this platform for um, people to join and to connect, to learn from each other, um, and to come up with ideas and initiatives to help speed up the process um, to tra to make a transition to a greener industry. And that's both from a carbon footprint point of view and also the content, as Lucy was just saying just now. Um, and we know the, that our footprint is huge. International wildlife documentaries obviously have a big footprint, given the, the amount of travel and tra uh, transporting kit that we need to do. And that's really key. But also the type of content that we produce has potential to have an even bigger impact and have more benefits. Um, so we wanted to find out what other people were doing and where whereabouts in the world. Um, and there's a lot happening already, which is great, and uh, both on a grassroots level and an industry level. Um, but we want to help speed up that process, basically, and help inform it through what we've learnt within the group and talking to international groups. Um, and given that people are talking about this being the decisive decade for action, um, so just trying to help make connections to, to speed up the process. Um, I know we're going to talk about We Are Albert a bit later, uh, but they're obviously a, a key organisation that we're in touch with already. And they do have lots of great tools and resources for us, which are helpful. But at the moment, they don't have wildlife-specific guidelines. So one of the initiatives that we're working on is we wanted to tap into this great hub of wildlife TV production companies here in Bristol. Um, and we've s set up a sustainability forum. So um, every three months at the moment, we're meeting. And we've only just started it, but um, we're we hear from each production company and they explain what they're doing already along these lines and what they'd like to be doing and we share case studies and we basically hear we want to understand the the barriers from a business perspective as well to help us talk about potential solutions as well and um and happily icon and wellscreen are both involved in that forum which is great to have their input great thank you very much indeed um we are going to talk about Albert. Can I just, would you just be useful to know how many of you know about Albert already? So that we're not kind of boring you with, okay, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But actually, I wondered, listening to you, um, the three of you, uh, actually, Lucy, you gave us a very good example with the, with the pandas of something you were, you were actually doing. Can I put you on the spot, Andy, because you were talking about having meetings before productions and talking about the sustainable impact. Um, Give us, give us an absolute example of something you've changed maybe in the last few years as a result of trying to be more sustainable. Uh, well, one of the things that we're working at the moment, we're collaborating with UE and in partnership with them to um, uh, develop technology that will ensure we, we are sending less people on location, we're sending uh, less kit on location, sending less drives backwards and forwards. Um, and we're having some, some success with that so far, and that's something we want to continue to pursue and understand and develop. Just, just generally, this is a kind of, again, put very much putting on the spot, how much have we done in terms of, here we are in Bristol, you know, I suppose the kind of world leaders in wildlife filming, filmmaking, how much have we done to train local people in the countries that we've been going to for years now so that we don't have to send... Bristolians out or whoever they are out to wherever it is they're filming and we can rely on people that we've trained and helped to learn the skills out there? Um, I mean, I think it's something that's been happening for a long time, but then, um, you know, the world's a very large place and so, you know, certainly ICON, we occasionally go back to the same place, so we may invest. We've currently got, we're working with a local 
um, in Zambia, who, but whether we will return to Zambia and continue to work with him, but we hope that it will give him the skills and the, the CV and the credit and the experience and confidence to, to pick up other work in that location so that there's less people flying from Bristol with kits. You want me to answer that? From well, I was actually going to... I thought you'd given a very good example. I was going to let you off the hook, okay. but if you want to give another one... I, I was just going to say, just because what well, I'd see, while Screen is neutral, we're not a production company, or, and we don't work in the industry, we're kind of around the, the frame. I, I'd say I'd say up until very recently, um, there's the, the odd company that does really invest in in-country talent, but I think one of the other silver linings of the festival... Uh, sorry, of the festival, of the pandemic, is... Um, uh, the, the production community has had to rely on in-country talent and I think they've realised that actually, you know, if you invest a little bit in training in those countries where we are going and filming and, and people do, production companies do tend to go to the same sorts of areas, there's a real opportunity there. So I'm hoping, you know, in the future rather than sending five people from Bristol, we might send two um, and, you know, there's there's opportunity there. The, this technology that we're working with you, Ian, also enables that more so that people who are in Bristol can have better access to those individuals on location as well and be able to live feedback to them about the work that they're doing so they get more um, direct coaching and direct access to that experienced level of person. Um, and, let, Christine, let me ask you, because you talked about gathering in intelligence from other places in order to share it and speed up the process. Can, yeah. can you give us a an example of something that that is really a, a game changer or making a difference or has happened? Yeah, I mean, I'd say the same as Lucy in that COVID's definitely broken the seal. So m we've had to do use more in-country crew. And we've also, I suppose it's helped highlight the places that maybe don't have people at the level that we need yet. So areas that we could then help with capacity building and training. Um, and again, yeah, w we've, we're learning that there are various groups you know, it makes sense for everyone to want to help create these pools of talent around the world. Um, and it's how do you, we want to try and help link all those different groups together. Um, so, for example, um, Wild Screen is working on um, helping with mentoring and training of, of uh, international crew. And Jackson Wild in the States also working on things like that. So it's whether, is there a way to kind of create a central database almost for people to access so we can link companies with the right crew in the right places um can i just ask you we'll, we'll come to audience question in a minute can i just ask you a question maybe, maybe um particularly you andy as a filmmaker how much do you think it is your obligation to use films as a campaigning tool or is it simply that you show these absolutely gorgeous places and people say oh we must we must preserve that it doesn't it look beautiful or 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 do you think that films now need to have a message in them i think films now absolutely need to have a message uh, a lot of the content we make at icon films isn't the blue chip natural history it will often have a, a human element or a story about um you know people in, in an environment as well so that it's it's a different um approach um to perhaps some of the films that um Christina might be working on and the, some of the films that are shown at Wild Screen. Um, but yeah, absolutely, they should, we should always have it in our mind and, and be intent that there will be some message in every, every film that we make. Right. Um, can we have a kind of indication of people who like to join in? Do you want to put up a hand if you have something to say or something to ask? Or um, uh, can, can we just hold on a minute? We'll try and get a roving mic. If we, yeah, it's coming down. So if we... If we start, any, any other hands, and then I can, um, I know Andrew wants to ask something, but let's, let's start down here and then. <coughs> and it would be really, really useful to know if any of you are involved in, in filmmaking where practices have changed, and because this is a kind of as much a forum to share, share that kind of thing as to, as to hear from us on the panel. Yeah. Well, I'll start by saying I'm a bit of a sort of philistine when it comes to sustainability and and natural film, but uh, just a couple of questions, really. Um, in a sense, how do you promote su sustainability in filmmaking? It's maybe just not just this panel, but wider in terms of film ecology. How do you promote sustainability when film is a driver for tourism, especially for um, developing countries? In a sense, after watching the latest James Bond film, I wanted to run off to the, lo the opening location in Italy as quick as possible, you know. And also, um, 
I'm not aware of what the stats are in terms of film productions on location, but I wonder in some ways whether or not we're kind of playing into carbon, the, the biggest challenge being the amount of carbon that gets used by heavy industry, um, oil, gas, and so on, and whether or not we're playing into some of that narrative by thinking mm -hmm. that the benefit of making people aware of, of climate change in terms of natural history films kind of offsets, in a sense, the uh, the footprint that's left or made, because I think what will the, the case will be the charge will be is you're as bad as us, so therefore no argument here. And I just wonder whether or not, in some senses, that we're kind of playing into that narrative. But perhaps it's a slightly incoherent question. So um, really interesting points, and if you think about the things like the birth of zoos, of course, before even wildlife films, the argument was you know you brought these exotic animals here, and therefore we didn't need to fly off and see them in their natural habitat, not the, with different kind of arguments for whether, whether that was a good thing. But again, with wildlife films, I guess when they started, it was before people could travel, and therefore they could enjoy in their own living rooms, and sitting and looking at the telly, at these beautiful things, and they didn't have the opportunity to go there. Do you think that we have, in a sense, crossed over that barrier where we are all, as you say, leaping off to find, to go and look at these places because they look so dropping gorgeous on your screens? I don't know why I keep looking at you, Andy. Let's start with Christina, <laughs> and then I'll come you. back to you. Um, I'm sure it does encourage people to go and visit those places because the industry makes them look so beautiful and and shows off the amazing wildlife. Um, I'm not sure if you, do you mean that that we shouldn't worry so much about the carbon footprint because of the benefits we're hopefully bringing? There are two separate questions. Okay. I think one is there is a, a conundrum there that if you, um, tourism, films drive interest in visiting locations. And the more, of course, the more we travel, and it's not just for natural, uh, wildlife documentation, I think it's a problem for any location based on perhaps as big as a budget and so on. Yeah. But so they're kind of two separate questions. One is a conundrum. What I don't know, you can escape that really, especially as tourism is a mainstay for so many developing um, countries. Um, and the second one is around, as you've kind of pointed out, um, there is the awareness raising through depicting natural, uh, the, the environment and the world uh, versus in some ways this offsetting or sustainability side. Um, but also what I've tried to throw into that is the kind of the narrative that gets developed around if the more we talk about sustainability and the footprint of the industry, the more in a sense uh, um, it can be also be gamed as an argument. And did you want to just pick up a bit on either of the tourism or the...? Um, well, I think tourism, I'm not an expert on tourism, but I believe a lot of the, certainly in Africa and um, South America and Southeast Asia, the reliance on tourism actually feeds into the conservation effort. So it's not so sort of neat and tidy that tor tourism isn't all bad at all in terms of the conservation of those environments, if that answers the question in some part. Um, and I think that... Um, you know, in terms of um, quite, quite often, I don't think you are told exactly where things are filmed. So mm -hmm. it, it's not as transparent as, you know, some films are. You know, I, I think I'm trying to think of certain blue chip natural history, certainly. You don't, you're not always told where it is. So it's not like you can Google and book yourself mm -hmm. a flight there. <laughs> so you just have to be left wondering and imagining from what you've seen on the TV. and. And are very unlikely that you would get the opportunity to see the behaviour and everything that you were, you were able to see in these films. I just wondered, I'm um, listening to this, Lucy, whether the after all the next wild screen, if people mm. are actually going to come and, and meet, and th did you say it's next year? Yeah, October 2022. Um, are you going to use that as an opportunity also for talking about this kind of thing and hearing from people and, and gathering uh, intelligence about what they're doing in terms of sustainability? Yeah, absolutely. So with our awards, um, we are going to gather baseline data on what people, what the industry is doing, um, both kind of uh, practically, but also editorially. So, you know, how much are they 
you know, giving people actions that they can take at the end of a, of a film. Um, so yeah, we, we're absolutely um, <coughs> going to be doing that. Um, and just, just thinking about your point, you know, that the industry is adapting, and I think, you know, that's one thing I think all the industry, you know, speaking, speaking on behalf of the wildlife industry, you know, they do really struggle with, you know, we, we make a huge impact in order to make our films, but as you say, the, the bigger picture is, you know, the more people that get to view those films, the more hopefully people will understand um, the pressures that we're putting on the natural world and how they can help solve them. Um, but the industry is also adapting. There's a new platform called Water Bear, which shows um, wildlife films for free. But at the end of each film, they kind of, talking to the ecotourism piece, they, they tell people about where you can go and experience nature. And they only work with companies where they have um, you know, the lowest impact as an ecotourism company. So the industry is kind of adapting as well. Um, to make sure that they point their viewers in that direction of, you know, travelling as ethically as possible. Um, so yeah, we, yeah, to both your questions, yes, we will be talking about all those things at the festival. Absolutely. Great. Does any? I know Andrew wanted to ask something, but there's any anybody else? Yeah, we've got one. Do you mind if I go right to the back and then we'll come forward and we won't forget Albert in our time as well. So there's. Sorry, right. Um, if you keep your hand up, and then and then we'll Hello. see you. There's, I think there's two of us at the back. It was there? oh, sorry. sorry. It's a, it's across. Yeah, it was you. I was thinking of. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Thanks. Um, it's a two two. It's not specifically about wildlife film. It's about sustainability. And I'm sorry. It's got very hard to hear. You can put it oh, on sorry. Side. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, it's about sustainability in the sector and cross. Conversations across different industries, like film and events, have very similar skill bases or in, in production specifically. Are you? There's loads of work that's gone on in events around sustainability in those conversations, and I was just wondering if there is there work going rather than trying to do the same things again. How how are those collaborations coming together? <coughs> Excuse me. And also with employment and those skill sets. Is it how how can we improve those and make a, a skills base within Bristol or you know nationally, but within Bristol I'm thinking of specifically. Great, thank you. And then if we could just pass the mic along to sorry, can you put your hand up? It's the yeah along there and we'll we'll take that in a second. Um, who would like to pick that up? Mm. So working across I mean I think well, that, that feeds Albert, into Albert, Albert doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, because that definitely that's, feeds into Albert, who are a, a, across the industry in all genres and they will um, offer they've got a very really good website which is wearealbert.org which anybody can go to and they provide all sorts of learning and, and shared knowledge from every different kind of program making and there's lots of case studies and and tools, most notably their um, carbon calculator, so that anybody who's um, setting out on a production can um, work to understand and measure the carbon impact and therefore if you understand it you can make changes to try and reduce it uh, but it's a it's an incredible industry tool and because they've been working for so long now they have a, a great database and you know, as Christina said wildlife filmmaking is currently sort of lumped in with factual documentary making which you know is still useful but um, it is it does sit on its own, and it will be good when Albert can uh, can define that differently. Um, but yeah, I think that's where a lot of the collaboration on sustainable program making is there, and I agree, lots of the same lessons apply across the board, whatever content you're making. Great, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, do you want to? Um, hello, can you hear me all right? I've got a bit of a cold, so forgive me. Um, I'm just, yeah, all of this is brilliant, and I'm all for it. I guess what I'm... I've been thinking a lot about recently is with COP26 happening in next month. Um, and uh, yeah, I, mean, I think we all know that um, traditionally, we, you know, this has been going, it's not just the current climate, it's been going on for 40 plus years. Um, you know, we've been aware of climate change and, you know, we've always been encouraged to individually change our actions. Um, but we know increasingly that it's, you know, 5% of the companies or the, you know, that are actually, they have more impact than all of us put together. So um, I guess what, while I agree and think that impact producing is really important, I've been a part of that, I guess what I'm, yeah, sort of asking or um, want to just, I don't know, express is that what, yeah, what can we do more to influence um, the sort of the decision makers and like key governments and policy makers and those companies like oil, gas, uh, industries to change their behaviour and invest in renewable energy and things like that. 
and I guess, yes, this more specific question is like um, probably more towards Christina is, um, have you, are you doing anything for COP26? Thank you. Thanks. Do you want to pass the mic forward? As a, if you put your hand up, lovely. Yeah, Christina, do you want to do that? Yes, sure. Um, we do have a, a team within FFW working on some short films for COP at the moment. Um, so their angle, mm -hmm. that's led by um, a producer colleague, Ruth Campbell, and she's got an amazing team working around the clock, it sounds like, to get these films done. So I think there's seven three-minute films, and they're basically along the theme of um, witness statements from us as filmmakers, camera operators, anyone involved in making wildlife programs, um, and often what they've seen change over time, or um, the, what they've seen disappear. Um, and the concept is, they're calling it be, uh, beyond the frame. So what we often aren't able to show or talk about in our programs, this is an opportunity to highlight some of those things at COP. And they'll also have a, a Q&A a panel afterwards to discuss basically um, a s similar kind of topics. So what could and should our role be within this current climate crisis? Will they then be about? They sound great. Will they be available for other people to see? I hope so. Yes. Yeah. I think we if we we're the team are looking at where they might where they might put the films after COP, but I think they're hoping that they might be live streamed on the day, which is the sixth of November, is their session in the Green Zone. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Yeah. Hi. <coughs> Hello. Um, yeah. Sorry, it's not another wildlife question, I'm afraid. But um, interested to hear your thoughts on the role of virtual production in the future of filmmaking, whereby you can uh, create environments without having to go on location, you know, shooting on uh, big LED walls where you can generate environments. Obviously, this wouldn't work for wildlife at all, but for, you know, there's a lot of Netflix and Amazon Prime shows now where they are using this, this technique. And just interested to get your thoughts on whether this is a trend that we're going to see in terms of, you know, the decision making of, do I need to go and shoot on location or can I create this environment virtually? Uh, to hopefully reduce the impact of um, of travel. Just interested to get your thoughts on that. Do you want, as our filmmaker, do you want to? Um, yeah, I'm sure. I think that's it's really interesting technology. I'm sure it's going to it's going to form a large part of the future and decisions. Perhaps not the kind of programs that any of us are making, but absolutely, I'm I'm all for that. Can I add to that as well? Um, yeah, we've been um, talking about that within FFW in as much as we've seen a few articles and try and keep track of tech that's coming through that could help us. Um, and I don't know if anyone's seen Mandalorian, but that was an amazing example of how they've used that equipment, that technology. Um, and we were trying to think, how could we use it in wildlife TV? Are there opportunities? And as you said, what, with wildlife behavior yeah, that's trickier but could there be opportunities for example with presenter links between um, episodes so you don't have to fly a presenter around the world um, you know I'm sure there there could be opportunities in there for us but I think the feedback from talking to a few people is that at the moment it's still really expensive to access so I, I guess the maybe that will change over time but I'm I'm I hope there could be some potential in there for that kind of technology. Yeah, the, re the reason I ask was I used to work for a, a disguise who's very much involved in virtual production and we we're always trying to quantify you know, the, the cost saving and also the environmental saving of doing this work. So I was interested to know. We didn't have many numbers on it, to be honest, to be fair. Um, but yeah, I think it's something which will be more, pre more prevalent in the future. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Interesting. Um, so uh, if we go to Andrew and then, and then along. Thank you. It's a question, it's partly about festivals. I mean, if you can come up with answers to the problems we all face with festivals, that would be extremely useful. And I think yep. that, um, um, you know, the more toolkits you can develop, the better for us. And I'd love to talk to you more separately about that, actually, about work we're doing. Uh, I, I was question about your, your decision not to award a, a panda. Mm. For that. Did people see this as a big wake-up call? You know, did, because the, the sector that I would have thought would have been most able to win a panda was the natural history sector in that area, but you decided not to do one. I mean, has this led to some kind of soul searching in the industry? And I've got a second question which, about production, which I'll come back to, yeah, but that one. 
Um, so I will just claim I was actually on maternity leave oh, when right. the decision was made <laughs> to not award the oh, panda. Well if I was there, I don't know, I might have made a slightly different decision. Um, I'll, I'll talk on behalf of Laura. Um, but what about the, it's really the aftermath. Yeah, I, so we, we insert, so whenever anybody entered our awards, we asked them what they were doing. Uh, and actually it was an optional question. So 2022, it's not going to be an optional right. question. Okay. You know, did you or didn't you? Mm. If you answer, we did, they're then going to have to fill in a, a separate mm. form about what they did and there'll be more measurables and there'll be a point system around it. Um, it's really interesting because it, it really depends on the production company and we work internationally as well. I think we're, you know, in some ways in the UK a little bit further ahead. But some companies that you would think are really thinking about their impact, I don't think are really. It's, an, it's very much an afterthought. Um, and that's what I feel like Wildscreen's role is. We need to challenge the industry. You know, there's a, there, there's a cost of you making these films. And yes, there could be potential benefits in raising awareness. But, you know, I think we need to start really measuring that impact on, on both the, the production impact and also the action impact because, you know, natural history in Bristol has been thriving for over 60 years. We're in COP now and we're still having the same conversations, you know, people aren't taking action, so something needs to change. And I, and I do think stories are a really powerful way of doing that, but I think we need to really raise our game like, massively in the next 10 years. Otherwise, you know, if we can't make people, um, you know, whether they're big businesses or, you know, individual person on the street take action, I don't, I don't know who else can, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, think, I think the industry's got a real challenge over the next, next few years to really raise their game. And that goes on to my second question. Can I? I mean, I agree with you. I think you know, time is running out and so on. But you know, one of the things that's blighted the BBC for years is they've often been accused of being t too balanced on an issue like climate change. You know, you have to bring the deniers in, uh, and so on. Now, I think that's changing a bit. But you know, the old adage, you know, that Samuel Goldwyn had about movie makers: if you want to send a message, use Western Union. You know, I mean, you are in that dilemma, aren't you? That you're trying to do good storytelling television but also sending a message as well. And how, how difficult is that? And are there subjects which are still forbidden for you to, to address in that way, do you think? Whether it's kind of implicitly or explicitly when you talk to commissioning editors and so on, and that's also for filmmakers of the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't very often talk to commissioning editors about the ideas, but I, certainly in the last few years, the conversation is much more available. You know two, three years ago, it was much harder to, to have those conversations. So I think progress is being made there. I think we all know the Blue Planet had such a massive impact that, that in itself, that one series did seem to make a shift. Um, so the, the conversations are much more available to us, but I think that there is often the conversation that's had initially, and then there's the conversation as you go through the process as well, and how far you can push it, and different commissioning editors, different channels will be braver or bolder or able to be more um, able to open up to filmmakers to put forward their position or tell stories that, um, but yeah, I, I think that has moved in definitely in the, in the right direction, but always more work to do. Thank you. We've just got one final question right Sorry. at the end of the row. Can I add something quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah please do. That. Sorry, I was going to say that um, within FFW, within the forum conversations with companies, but also hopefully with commissioners, we want to talk about is it, is it even possible to redefine the success of a programme to not just be about viewing figures? Can it, can it be more than that? And that's the conversation that we want to, to have and see what the commissioners are open to you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, hi. Uh, really great panel, so thank, thanks a lot. Um, just on virtual production, you're not part of Vero, are you, by any chance? So, um, one, of, one of the 88... Oh, you are? Oh, great. Well, I can just do a quick plug for you then. <laughs> so one of the 188 companies in the city that we've been looking at are Vero, and they do amazing virtual production stuff. So you can go to their website, which is made with Vero, um, which is Sorry, really, really good. V E R O. If I'm pronouncing okay. that right. Um, so yeah, so so that's that's um, yeah, it's ex extraordinary to think about the possibilities there. Um, question mostly for Christina. So as, as you know, we've interviewed you for the report and things. I've been aware of FFW for some time, having lurked on the main uh, WhatsApp <laughs> group there. Um, 
Yeah, and I'm just amazed at the amount of work that you guys are doing. And, and the fact that you're doing it on a voluntary basis is just incredible. And, but also, I suppose there's a question, Mark, about the sustainability of the group. And, you know, to what extent is, are there possibilities for the wildlife sector to support what you're doing? And, and can you see a kind of future where, I don't know, maybe you'll be resourced by the industry, perhaps, to, to kind of continue to do what you're doing? And... What are you, are you having those conversations, and is the future bright from that <laughs> perspective? <laughs> um, you're, thank you. Yeah, you're totally right, and um, it is difficult to do around our day jobs, and it's because it's diff difficult for everyone. That's one of the challenges is um, for any of us is to do this on top of our existing jobs because at the moment it's not necessarily i mean it's sounding like it's it is becoming built into places like icon but a lot of companies still aren't creating the time and space for people to investigate the greener options or to trial things we don't have time and funding to pay for that time to try out more eco-friendly ways of doing things so i would say time and funding for that time are two of the main challenges i don't know how you guys feel about that but um but yeah we we are we're aware that we want what we're doing to be sustainable in itself for the long run. Um, if we can, if if this forum proves useful, like we've literally just started it, but if, if it evolves into something really useful, then hopefully we might be able to find some funding source to, if we can prove its worth um, to continue that. Uh, and the same for other FFW projects. We're we're just starting to get to that point where we want to. Uh, look at options but it's almost it's a job in itself to find the funding so um, but yeah it's definitely starting to be on our radar because we we realize how much there is that we could be doing and and helping to feed in to to the process so um yeah good luck brilliant we've literally run out of time but thank you very much indeed great questions and a terrific panel so thank you for the thank you very much Fantastic panel and look forward to those debates continuing. We've got one final panel now and we'll have one final reading at the end of that. Um, Laura Marshall is going to be chairing this. I'll let her introduce uh, the panel um, when she manages to get to the front. Um, at the end of the session, Laura Edson's going to be reading from his essay. Um, so if we factor in the time for that, that would be uh, good as well. So I'll hand you over to Laura Marshall. Thank you, Laura. Hello. Oh, I didn't take off my mask. Hello. Um, now, I'm looking for Michael, he's coming, and I'm looking for Stacy, and I'm looking for Natalie. Oh, look, there we are. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Laura Marshall. I've been outed as the chair of Wild Screen, who meanly decided not to award a a prize for sustainability. Um, it wasn't me, it was the judges. So I totally supported them. And I love it, because when Lucy went on maternity leave, she left me able to do things that she was trying to manage when she got back. Anyway, um, I was very glad to hear that there was a little baby in the audience. And I was thinking, we really are at the um, festival of the future city with our future little person coming on board. Um, and it feels really relevant in terms of the conversation that has just been led by um, Ginny and that panel, but also um, relevant to this panel. Did, did you all get your questions? Thank you. Um, so look, I'm just going to do a quick introduction. I'm told not to keep it for too long. Um, and Natalie, you've already met. And what I'm always interested in um, people when they sit up here, because yes, you're in charge of film and UNESCO, but um, you've also had um, a career that over 18 years experience working in the film and television sector. And you started an Encounters Film Festival that many of you will be aware of before moving into film locations, logistics and coordination. So Natalie brings a real knowledge of the sector. And, and I think sometimes we can get confused by people's titles and think that's who they are. And Stacey, welcome. You're um, currently, I like that, cr the Creative Diversity Coordinator for Nations and Regions at Channel 4 here in Bristol, their new hub. Um, 
but graduated in 2017 from UE in graphic design, so you're a graphic designer, and you've worked across history, podcasts, and film, and your first job was at the BBC, Natural History Unit, um, and has been named as one of Bristol's most influential creatives under 24, um, and lots of other awards that they will come into their journey. And then Michael, hello Michael. Um, Michael is a self-shooting director, producer, just started his new production company. Well, not just, it's now, what, 18 months then? Yeah, about 18 months ago. Yeah. Black Wave, fantastic, a new addition to the burgeoning independent sector in Bristol. Winner of multiple awards, and you've just uh, directed your first short film for CBBC, and you're part of the BAFTA BFI Network Crew 2020, which I'm sure you'll tell us a bit more about. And me, so I run Icon Films, which is a medium-sized production company in Bristol. Um, I'm chair of Wild Screen, and I do a few other things. I'm also governor of a school out in Witherwood um, Merchants Academy, and I think that helps me understand a little bit about the pathways to employment in the creative industries. Um, so, um, they are a fabulous panel, and um, I've got a few questions that we've talked a bit about, because... I think what's really useful in these sessions to hear about people's journey w and, and, and to hear concrete examples of what they've, they have experienced or where we think we're going. So today it's really about um, looking at the elements of sustainability in a city of film, which is Bristol, a city of content making. How are we going to keep going? You know, it's burgeoning, it's interesting, but we're not there yet. Um, so, I'm going to start with you, Natalie, because you're all over there. Um, what do you think are the elements of sustainability as we look at the growing success of Bristol as a centre of content creation? And I think we can use sustainability, you know, define it yourself, and I'll, you won't define it the same as Stacey will or the same as Michael will, um, but, yeah, sure. So, um my role, as we sort of talked about earlier, is very much based around the sustainable development goals that the UN have set. So my, so when I'm thinking about sustainability, I'm thinking about it in a very holistic way, um, around ed education, around um, infrastructure, and around um, the city as a whole, and how we can, how the film and TV industry sort of feeds into that, but also how, um, how it gives something back. So, uh, I think I touched on it earlier. If you know, we have a. a of this hugely growing sector, I, my work is very much focused on TV drama, um, and that side of the sector is growing exponentially because the con there's so much demand for content, um, and especially you know especially in TV now more so than film to some extent. And it, my in, my interest in sustainability is how we make sure that the people in Bristol benefit from that growth in drama, how we make sure that the investment that Bristol Film Office sees every year on year predominantly which comes from drama itself um, it goes into jobs how it goes into employment how it how it goes into education and learning um, sustaining the sector in an environmental the, with an environmental focus as well um, and it's uh, it's about how those uh, sort of that circular economy if you like so there's that we have so much talent and so much um, infrastructure in the city that benefits the industry and how we make sure that that industry feeds the infrastructure itself so that companies and individuals freelancers are able to grow and develop into the future hopefully that and uh, do you have a sort of example of where you see that working i mean do you want to i mean we've talked a bit about bottle yard but yeah. um, are there other examples in your own career where you have seen um that, that move, that, that, that growing circular economy. Yeah, so one thing that we established very early on with Bristol as a city of film uh, was focused on primary education because it was a, a gap that we identified in Bristol. There was, there was no real um, established provision for primary film education. And it's something that other cities of film had done fantastically. So Bradford is a shining example of how you can establish film education um, in a city uh, specific to, to primary schools. And it was it's a programme, so we have a four-year programme in Bristol now that is it's called Film for Learning. And it's training teachers and senior leaders in 10 Bristol schools. It's also taking place in Bradford and Belfast um, in how to use film as a tool for literacy. So children will present their ideas in film, they'll storyboard, They'll, you know, they'll they'll make the film using 
basic technology and then they'll stand up and present their ideas to the class and those skills in themselves have been proven to, um, to make a massive difference to, to literacy attainment and, and we are fortunate now to have it in Bristol so that's something that very early on we, t we look to bring in knowing that in uh, educating children and parents about careers in the film and TV industry and even just having exposure to film technology means that there's more understanding about how you can build a career in the sector in the future and then we're building that talent from the ground up in the city. And does that sit outside <laughs> the curricula? So is it ex-curricula or is it in part no, of the national it's curriculum? it's built into the curriculum, so it's in Interfilm. That is the, really the circular economy, yeah, that absolutely. is exactly what So Interfilm are the organisation that, that run it and created it and it's funded by the Paul Hamlin Foundation um, and it's delivered in Bristol by Boom Satsuma, um, so it's, it's a, a national uh, initiative but with a local, a local focus and local outcomes. Thank you. That's a really fabulous example. Stacey, do you want to talk a little bit about what you think the elements of sustainability are? Um, I mean, we look to you as a spokesperson for Channel 4, but you are obviously more than, the, than that title. And um, what are your feelings, thoughts, stories around that? Um, I think a lot of it, um, for me, um, and within my role, comes... Um, with diversity and representation um, and inclusivity as well. I think it's so important um, where we are now to really support and fund new voices and emerging talent. And for me personally, kind of graduating and thinking about finding my way in the industry and feeling very alone and understanding what it is to kind of be in your own space and try and create your own lane with not a lot of support I think a huge part of like where I am now in my role is making sure that going in at that point at that entry level role and really supporting talent that are making their own content and um, that are making their own way um, across so many different lanes and are not so like kind of linear anymore as kind of we what t um, what kind of going into TV has been I think a huge part of that is just tapping into that and 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 funding that, adding money to that um, is a huge part. So I think that that in itself is a huge part of sustainability, and also just within trying to kind of really making sure we're supporting like off-screen talent um, and bringing them to the faces of indies and kind of removing that kind of gatekeeper um, mentality. So I think that in itself um, is a step towards, as well as a huge element of um, making kind of the content and the people that make the content more sustainable. I think absolutely true that you know we know sustainability is about renewal. You can't you yeah. can't be sustainable if you're not giving birth and, and and supporting and nurturing it. And when you talk about that gatekeeper role, are you sort of are you are are you acting as sort of partnership guidance? Are you bringing together talent and opportunity through individuals and production companies? Is that how it's working? Yeah. So. Um, half of my role really so my role is kind of split into two so it's supporting channel four with the with all of our productions and adhering to like the diversity guidelines but then the other half is with me being from bristol and being and growing up in bristol and going to school here and kind of understanding the ecosystem here um is building those relationships with indies um to kind of really support them in finding talent and also supporting the kind of the commissioning process um and just kind of a lot of it as well is to do with outreach and kind of being on the ground at that grassroots level as well to engage with the community and to engage with talent as well and kind of bring them into the fold. Okay. And Michael, you know, you're starting, um, you started your uh, production company with your partner and you're um, building your own body of work and connecting with people to work with. You talk, I think, when you think about sustainability, obviously you're thinking about sustainability of your company, and that's the microcosm of, of, of tell us a bit about um, how you see sustainability. Yeah, I think sustainability is, uh, I think I definitely echo what Stacey was saying about diversity and representation being at the, the core of it, really, because I feel like if you don't get the next generation involved, it's just going to die out or they'll just be, you know, I mean, maybe they will just be making films on their on their phones or, what, what uh, you know, and, and uploading it themselves and, and being the sort of... Um, controlling their own content because for years you know people have been shut out or don't see themselves in in this industry so mm -hmm. I, I feel like i mean really to be sustainable i mean I, i've done a lot of work before in the past with um schools you know in, in the inner city of bristol and on the outskirts 
And literally, some of these schools don't have no provision when it comes to filmmaking, content creation, mm -hmm. learning about film, cinema. Um, even though a lot of these pupils will be, you know, creating content on mm -hmm. their, you know, through their social media. So they're already, they already have an understanding of the language, but there isn't any support mechanisms in place to actually help them think about the industry and think about the, the sort of all the different jobs that are involved in the industry. And that, so I feel that, you know, new, new talent, um, new voices, you know, really thinking about how we bring people through and keep people in, in keep people here and keep people in the industry. I think that is, um, that's gonna be a, a tricky. I think keeping people here, keeping people talent, making sure they don't, pe keeping talent here, make sure they don't go off mm -hmm. to other places is gonna be, you know, something that the city will struggle with. I think if we don't um, identify those, those, those gaps, I think Interfilm is a really, is really important, you know, and I, th and I feel like I wanna see more of, more of this provision in schools because that's the you know it's the next generation that's gonna that's gonna make it sustainable. I think that's all really important. So the education and the pathways through understanding that there is an actually a career, but where's the money coming from? You know who's going to pay for the content that the people are going to make or wanting to make? Which goes to my next question, which is, where do you think the future of Bristol is in terms of growing production? and growing content creation. Where's that growth coming from? So where is, you know, is it digital? Is it drama? Is it natural history? Is it conservation? Is it climate awareness? You will all have different opinions about that, but um, I'm interested in knowing because sustain adding money is important to, sus to sustainability, just as growing talent is. Where do you think that sustainable um, growth will come from? Where, where, where is the content that people are wanting to make being seen? Where, do, where does that work in terms of the people you're working with and the content you're creating? I mean, as far as like content and things that we're creating, I mean, as Black Wave, we, we have a two strand, we have a, like a two pronged approach. You know, we do documentaries, but we also do um, drama, short dramas at the moment. Um, but I think where the industry's going is, is it's all online. And as far as if you speak to your average eight-year-old and you ask them what program they've recently watched on TV, they won't be able to answer that question, but they'll be able to tell you the YouTube series that they're watching or the YouTube personalities. So I, I, I feel like, and the way that technology is democratizing this industry as far as, you know, Anybody can really make make a film. Anybody can have those can can get access to a camera. I feel like the future of of content creation will will lie in, you know, will lie in drama. I feel like drama is something that is growing, and I feel like it's something that people want to see being created here. Mm -hmm. um, so I do feel like that is a it's it's a really sort of interesting time. And I know in the last eighteen months there's been loads of dramas that's been happening in Bristol. Um, so I'm just concerned that those, as long as the people in Bristol are actually being able to work on these, these programs, then I feel like Bristol could be a real hub for that drama creation. Like I think it was a few years ago, or 10 years ago, I think. So maybe we'll be going back, back to that. So it will just be natural history, it will be documentaries, as well as, you know, the drama. And I think digital is gonna be very much a part of content creation going forward and, and every company is going to have to think about how they make stuff digi uh, for digital um, release. Natalie, when we were speaking before um, the panel, this prepping for it, you talked mm. about storytelling and how important it was. Um, and here we can talk about, you know, being Bristol, because this is a Bristol festival of ideas, about um, UNESCO City of Film supporting local filmmakers telling stories. And I questioned you a bit about what local meant and what storytelling meant. And speaking to Michael's point about supporting emerging filmmakers telling stories of their, telling their stories, can you talk a bit about how UNESCO City of Film, Brit Bristol City, yeah, talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with you, Michael. I think that um, the, the fr a frustration in the in the film office is that Bristol, when um, when it's 
uh, depicted on TV isn't always Bristol. It's not always represented as the city. Um, it doubles as other locations, and you don't often hear Bristol accents within the, within the content, and the, the productions themselves don't derive from the city. So the challenge, I think, for Bristol, and it was picked up on earlier, is how, how do we make sure that we are um, nurturing the local talent to produce the content and, the, and um, bring the production companies or create the, com the production companies in the city so we have that indigenous um, storytelling happening? You know, there are some hugely talented storytellers in the city already establishing themselves, but you know, as the other two panelists have pointed out, there's you know there's all this talent at ground level that we could nurture up through the ranks. Um, how do we make sure that we that we're, we're able to do that as a city and we have the infrastructure in place, particularly around drama, because there is a huge amount of drama <laughs> filming taking place, but it isn't necessarily coming from it isn't being created you know, or being uh, derived from the city. So. We just need to make sure we can find ways to bring more indigenous drama to Bristol. And that's no mean feat, you know, it's something we've talked about for many years. Um, but it, it is something we're focusing on heavily um, in the City Council, you know, as a city of film as well, because drama is a big area of growth. Um, and we need, to, we need to be able to harness that in a better way. I think, Stacey, you know, the clue, creative diversity, which is where, where do we have more... Um, engagement, diversity, representation in Channel 4's output. When you're talking about local storytellers coming to you, saying, how do I get to get my story? How, how do I get my story funded? How can I do this? Where, where does that sit? I mean, I know you're not responsible for the drama department of Channel 4, so I'm not going to... But tell me a bit about um, how you think your role plays into that or Channel 4's very public placing themselves in Bristol plays into that. Um, I think it's, I think with Channel 4 um, kind of hiring me as the Creative Diversity Coordinator and also having the Bristol Hub, I think that in itself says a huge part of just investing um, in new talent and, and having different voices on Channel 4, on screen and off screen. And a huge part of what we're kind of looking at and doing at the moment um, is very much digital. Um, and I think with Black to Front um, that we had last month, um, which was like the 24-hour programming of black content. Tell, I'd, is everybody aware of what Black to Front was? Perhaps you could Ish, just tell. Yeah. Um, so Black to Front was um, a 24-hour day of programming um, with black, um, black on-screen talent and made by predominantly um, black um, talent as well um, off-screen. It was a great day, and I think a huge part of that, I mean, we had some great kind of digital commissions and a huge part of what we kind of saw was that a lot of talent um, were making they were making their own kind of digital content, uh, but didn't necessarily know how to get onto TV, mm -hmm. um, or didn't know who to talk to, etc. Um, a lot of that, a lot of that came from like the Black to Front call out, and what we, and one of the huge things that we were trying to show people is that this talent is out there. It's always been out there. It's just that you have to kind of take the time to make sure you you find that talent. And it's about being a lot more proactive rather than reactive. And I think within my role, I don't have the beauty of being a commissioner and being like, yeah, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you that, I'm going to give you that. I wish I could. But it's very much um, being able to put people in front of the right people and, and kind of being a facilitator and being a catalyst. And that's kind of how I see my role as like within the creative diversity team and i think as underrepresented under especially underrepresented people sometimes you really need that yeah you need that person to be able to put you in front and i if i look kind of back in my years sometimes i've been very grateful to have the people that can put me that can put me in the room with the right people um but yeah i think kind of like with, yeah we're talking about drama but i think digital in itself is very much noticing gen like gen z millennials especially gen z with everything that they've been creating on TikTok over the pandemic has just has just shown everybody the ability that that generation has and the fact that that's the generation of the future um and especially then the uh, underrepresented within that i think that's a huge thing that we kind of have very much have to take notice of and very and be very proactive what's happening here on the grounds right in Bristol as well. And I haven't seen the reports, but I'd be interested to know what the audience uh, research told Channel 4 about the people who turned into Black to Front. Yeah. And whether audience 
engagement went up, went yeah, down. Def- yeah. If it was a new audience, did they reach a new audience? Yeah, yeah, and definitely. What yeah. that's going to mean to future commissioning, which obviously will have an impact on what Michael's pitching. And well, yeah, exactly. I mean, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to. I mean, because I think there was a study done recently in America, and uh, I think it was uh, the figure was um, because Hollywood doesn't um, isn't catering to its black uh, Latino audiences. I think it's losing about 10 billion. Um, I think it was a year from, that was a study that was done. And, and I wondered what type of study like that, what that would say in the UK. I mean, I'm guessing it's gonna be a very similar amount that the industry here is losing because it is failing to be representative and, and speak to those audiences. So as far as, so when it comes to sustainability, apart from it being an ethical thing to do, I think, you know, it, it, it's all about the bottom line in this industry. So yeah. I, I feel like we've got to take it seriously because if we don't, then the industry will, 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 will crumble because people will not care about what these production companies are making. They just won't engage in yeah. it. Yeah, representation and, and is good for business. It's good for business. And you look at the, um, you know, these, these kids on TikTok, the language of cinema that they, you know, they're learning the language of cinema through TikTok, through social media. Um, so I think, you know, online is... is is the future, unfortunately, which is unfortunate for places like here, because you know cinema is so important for that engagement. But I feel like a generation has been lost because I suppose film, TV has just been seen as a very elitist industry for a long, very, very long time, very white and very elitist. And until we change that, I, I think you know it's not going to be what we what, what's been happening is not sustainable. Yeah, and that's I think that that audience research is going to be really fascinating because it will have an impact. Doing a big, you might call it a stunt or you might call it an intervention or whatever you want to call it, it made a difference in it. And, and but the impact is is going to be what matters. Um, we d- we talk about sustainability and new entrants and growth and representation, and there are lots of schemes out there aiming to increase representation, to increase education, pathways to employment, you know, and um, everything from government-led kickstart, bringing people from uh, uh, people on universal credit between 17 and 23 coming into the industry, um, uh, creative access, creative diversity network, some of the things, and I hope that you'll be able to tell us a bit more about some of the other schemes that are coming in. But really... You know, we all go scheme, schemes. You know, what's the importance of schemes? And I'd really like to hear from you individually <coughs> where schemes might have helped you in the past and where you think they might help others and what they actually mean. And um, who wants to kick off? I don't mind kicking off. I mean, kick off. I think, on, there, Michael, I think off. there are there are schemes that are really, really important. You know, I mean, I didn't go to um, college or university to study film. I literally just picked up the camera and just learned as I went along. And um, doing little workshops, I mean, a, a company called Calling the Shots, I think Jeremy's in the audience, they were really important as far as um, my development. And I saw the schemes that they were doing really gave people that first opportunity to make, you know, um, a legitimate film with some with, with, with a budget, I guess, mm-hmm. because a lot of people, you know. So I think... Really important, a budget, a, th- a budget, the money. So I think that's really, really important. And obviously I want to plug a scheme that... Um, Black Wave, we've just partnered up with the BFI uh, for a second round of um, a scheme called New Voices where we're trying to give people their first opportunity of making a film backed by the BFI and going through a process with young, talented writers, directors to, to, to sort of um, walk them through that process because, you know, we, we realise that there's, there's loads of gaps missing and there's only so much we can plug, but I feel like the schemes are really important. But you and Dr. Mina Fombo were had the confidence to start your own production company. You know, mm. that is, it's, it's gutsy, you know. Mm. And it's either, you know, I started my own production company because I wasn't sort of clever enough to realise how dangerous it was. <laughs> but I think, you know, 30 years on, people are a lot cleverer and they know quite how difficult it is. Um, which of those schemes do you think gave you the opportunity to think, oh, I can make my lifestyle a business. Um, I'm not sure one of those... I think I was a bit disillusioned with the actual industry itself. Um, 
join the club. Yeah, and the fact that I don't know, I've done some research and there was n there was no out of 150 production companies in Bristol, there was not one that was black led, and I thought that was rich because everybody's talking about diversity and. But how are you really going to get diversity if the people are pitching these ideas, these companies, are not diverse themselves? I mean, so that was, I think, the, the main catalyst for us to start a production company. But as I said, to get the confidence to maybe even think that I could do that, it was through companies like, you know, Steve and Jeremy at Calling the Shots that were, you know, a stepping stone into working with, you know, the first time I worked, done something for Channel 4 was through... Um, random acts scheme that Calling the Shots was running with the Arts Council on Channel 4. And, you know, a lot of, so, and we helped a lot of filmmakers create their first film. So I think those type of schemes where you've and got- And you created money, a network. And you create a network, so yeah. So you had, you had the support of your peers. You had yeah. that peer-to-peer -peer network. And that definitely give you, gives you confidence. So I feel like those type of schemes where you've got um, a company that's, you know, understands, you know, the, the young people that they're working with, but then you've also got the channel that's putting money into it. You've got, you know, Arts Council or a national funder that's putting money into it. You've got the city council that is supporting that, 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 you know, when it comes to like giving permission for permits and things like that. I mean, that is you really. You had circularity. Important. You had what we talked about earlier. That sort of sustainability. It would, it could go on. Mm. Stacey, is there anything that Channel Four is doing at the moment, or anything that you personally have been involved with in the past that has really helped you, or will help others? Um. Yeah. I mean. So just to answer the first part, like Channel 4 um, has got quite a few schemes. I mean, you've got the Accelerator, which is supporting black, Asian, minority, ethnic-led indies. And then you've got um, the Emerging Indie Fund, which is supporting um, indies um, in the nations and regions, which is really important. And then kind of for individuals, you've got post-production, which is very much focused on entry level and getting them within productions and providing the training and providing um, half of the funding as well. Um, but for me, on a personal level, I, um, I'm i very scared of applying for schemes. I've only ever applied for one in my life because I'm traumatised by rejection. <laughs> um, but um, I'm sure we all agree with yeah, that. Yeah, but I remember applying for one. So the only one I've ever applied for, and I got it, um, um, which was the Creative Mental Network. But it wasn't Bristol-based. Mm -hmm. So I was working at UE after I had just graduated, and I, and I think I had to travel to London twice, twice a week. Um, wow, and what's very interesting <laughs> about that scheme is um, I didn't get a job with the company after, which is fine. But it very much gave me it very much gave me the confidence of of being in a huge space, having a voice, being in a very very big big company, having a voice, and just feeling like I was able to be in that space. Um, and you I think there. yeah, it, and I think a lot of that and kind of like what Michael was saying is about building the confidence and building the network and what that does for people and what that does for young people especially, especially those who are trying to find their way, um, is a huge thing in their career. And I think I've had, so not, I didn't necessarily have a lot of schemes, but I've had a lot of kind of organisations and institutions, whether that's UE, UOB, or the Arnold Feeney, the Watershed Spike Island, very much invest in my, in the different things that I was doing and supporting that. And that in itself has, has kind of gave me the confidence to even step into the BBC or gave me the confidence to even be in this role because it wasn't if it wasn't for those things or even that scheme and being in such a massive massive corporation i don't think i would have the confidence to be able to even to be able to sit on here and kind of ex talk about my experience or talk about the journey and kind of how i've gone to these different spaces so it's a huge part but also retention i think is especially important when you have schemes to be able to continue nurturing the talent and supporting them and building the network because the last thing you kind of want to do is bring someone onto a scheme and then they drop off at the end and then you kind of like you, you're not really supporting their future so it's just about making sure you really invest and nurture in that talent post the scheme as well uh, that's you know so important and i think all of us who are invested in supporting schemes or those of you who are considering whether you're going to be mentors or <coughs> how you can offer support to emerging filmmakers just hearing that testimony from the youtube talking about how important it's been to me why you're sitting up on the panel why you're out there helping other people is inspirational and reminds us all of the value of these schemes because they do come you know, as somebody who sees a lot of them, they come at you and you have to look at the value of them and hearing that testament is really important. Natalie, um, you know, you I don't know if you've ever been the beneficiary of any mentoring schemes or 
new entrant schemes or you have just been sort of administrating them or creating them with Bottle Year? Tell us well, a little bit about I, that. I think what we do with City of Film more than anything is we um, advocate, you know, and we, and we promote and we, we share news of those schemes and we try to get them out to as many people as possible and also connect them where possible to city partners around the world so if there's you know like for like schemes then there's p potential for talent exchange and really and things like that um but i i would i would echo stacy's comment i think the after you know the aftercare that comes you know, that's needed with schemes and i think particularly in an industry um, like film and TV where it is incredibly cutthroat it's a really difficult industry to navigate it's a really difficult industry to stay in if you don't feel supported um, so the pa that sort of pastoral support element is something that I think as a city we can give to each other across organisations and there's a connecting up of schemes and organisations there's so much partnership working that goes on already but um, making sure that that's in place, making sure that people, if they're not successful in getting onto a, a program of work, they're able to get onto something else or, you know, they're supported into something so that they don't feel like they're out on a limb. Um, and if they're coming off a scheme, they don't feel like they have to <coughs> enter into an industry they don't fully understand um, where there aren't mentors and, and people there to support them through it. So I think that's something as a city, um, we've, we've, you know, we're working with others to, to create and to, to build those links. Um, <coughs> I know that Channel 4 are really keen on, on that as well, as how we how we make sure that talent isn't lost in the system. They're, they're not falling through the, the gaps um, and people feel fully fully supported throughout. And you know, there's, a, there's a big mental health crisis in the film and TV industry as well. Um, so at any stage in someone's career, how do they make sure they can access the support they need as a freelancer? So there's, you know, there's that element of it as well. Well, thank you. Um, we've got a bit of time for questions, if there are any questions. Oh, Mr Kelly, he's got a question. But I, I don't want to take precedence of any organisers. Well, oh, and there's a question <laughs> over there, and there, um, three, four, five, oh, this is really good. But who gets the microphone first? Okay, could we give it to uh, no, no, Andrew I'm, first? Because actually I want to ask one question. <laughs> Sorry. And then, if you could put, keep your hand up. Yeah. I mean, first of all, thank you very much. I mean, this has been really inspiring and instructive. And Stacey, for someone who's scared of schemes, you've got a 100% record from what I could read. So, so I think we need to learn lessons from you there. But um, Michael, it, it's a question for Michael, really, because if you're friends with Michael on Facebook, you, you're watching a real-life case study before your eyes, really, with your film Pitney. And, and what lessons have you learned from that in terms of what went right and what could have gone better? Well, that's a, that's a deep question, Andrew. I mean, oh, what did I learn from? I mean, we shot it during COVID, so that was there was loads of issues with it as far as, like, how we wanted to shoot it. But I don't know. I think with Pick Me, I'm learning the, the film festival circuit. I'm learning, you know, what film festivals are all about. I mean, I'm learning about, you know, I mean, I created loads of... I mean, I was very aware of how to make films for a long time, but I think... Going, I mean, going through that process with the BFI, I mean, having, you know, the watershed, I mean, having this space here is a real hub. Um, and it's grown as a hub over the years as well with the BFI having a presence here. And just, you know, being supported through that process, that was that was really important for me. And then I think, you know, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think the, the reaction to my film is making me think, well, Am I supposed to be here telling stories? Now I look at um, a lot of black actors in, in the UK and, and where are they? They're not in the UK and, and there's a reason for that. And the reaction to my film and the way it's being received, I mean, it got picked up by, you know, a really big film festival in America and, and it's, I don't know, you just start asking questions about yourself like, oh, maybe I should be focusing here a little bit more. So I, I don't know, I'm, it's, it's, it's definitely like the, my film that, has allowed me just to figure out what I want to do, what I want to say, and my audience, I guess. Uh, another two questions up there, and then there. Could you put your hands up, just those two, at the top, and then Mr. Spoxman? If you could leave your hand up, then they can... Hi, hello, I'm Jeremy from Calling the Shots. Thank you, Michael, for your nice words. Um, I just wanted to talk about kind of like the business uh, of, uh, behind making drama. Uh, Michael, you and I both probably want to employ more people and be able to do longer projects and bigger projects. Um, but like you said, also, Bristol hasn't had a huge uh, history lately of drama production. 
And it just takes, uh, and obviously people, um, companies like Icon, you know, have been here for longer. They, they, they've learned the ropes, etc. But I, you know, in a way, I think one of the things to, to be sustainable would be to is to, to learn the art of the business of making drama so that we can make, uh, credibly make longer dramas and be producers that are trusted and are able to handle bigger budgets and employ people. Because mm. what we want to do is all the guys that have come up through, you know, new creators and random acts you mentioned before, but all the other kind of grassroots organizations, we want to be able to employ them if they want to be employed in, 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 in Bristol. So I think it's, uh, just just a point about the about the business of it, and that kind of support is really important. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thank you, uh, Dave. And, and then, did you want to respond to that, or was that just a, a comment? Oh no, I was just agreeing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, for me, it's two questions. Uh, the first question is: You talk about these schemes. How visible were they to you? How easy were they for you to find? And the second part of the question, we're talking about writing here, aren't we, basically? How much did you support, did you get or would you want, or is that out there to help and mentoring on the writing side? Because what Jeremy says is absolutely right. How you build the industry is taking ownership of the stories and the IP and producing those stories. And that comes down to how well those stories are written. Hmm. So the first question is, the visibility is the thing I'll talk to, talk to you about, the schemes that are there and the training pathways, how visible they were to you, literally, and the second part is how much support you got to write great stuff. Thank you. I mean, as far as writing, um, I did a script development um, workshop with the BFI, so that was really, and they give, gave me um, a script editor. So I had full support from them as far as them helping me figure out how to tell the story and tell the story right. So that was that was that was vital for, for me um, personally. As far as the schemes, they weren't visible to me when I was when I wasn't looking for them. If that makes sense, I wasn't. They weren't visible for for me. I didn't engage. That's why I just sort of picked up a camera and just started learning. I went to YouTube University. I started learning, <laughs> watching YouTube, and then going out and making stuff and trying stuff. I didn't see it. I didn't. I wasn't really. I didn't. No schemes were sort of visible to me. And Stacey, um, yeah. for you, the um, schemes? Yeah, I would echo that. Um, schemes weren't kind of very much visible to me unless I really kind of did a hard um, Google search. Um, yeah, and I think I think maybe it's a little bit telling the fact that um, I felt like I could apply more for a, a scheme based in London than I could in Bristol. Mm. Um, mm. So I think that's also something that might, that, and that, that was, oh, when was that, like three years ago, but I think that's also kind of important. And in retrospect, from the other side of the fence now, mm -hmm. um, how do you think people who have schemes could do better to find people in the areas that they're looking for talent in? Um, I think it's about thinking about where you advertise your schemes and mm -hmm. the kind of audience that that brings in. Mm -hmm. um, I think because I studied design and so I was kind of very much connected with like where you'd kind of go, like the Arnold Feeney, Spike Island, like the watershed, you kind of knew those places. So I think I was in a sort of privileged position to mm -hmm. understand or have an idea of where to look, mm -hmm. but not a lot of people are in, those, are in those circumstances. So I think it's very much looking at kind of community-based organisations that reach those people are kind of like a grassroots level and that don't necessarily um, have those doors open to them. Um, I think that's a huge factor. Yeah, thinking about where you communicate um, and where you're trying to reach people and going more on a community-based level rather than like a quite high industry Thank level. you. I think community-based is a yeah. really important yeah. phrase and it's not used enough and understood enough. Thank you. Edson and then... Uh, yes. uh, just a quick comment to add to that. I think one of the issues is that the community base has been decimated by uh, austerity and then by, obviously, the pandemic. So that base, which would be the partner, which would make life much easier, is very fragile. Um, what I wanted to pick up on was just something that was, I think, relates to what Michael's saying. I've worked with Michael, but also perhaps all the panelists. And I just wonder whether one of the issues around Bristol and filmmaking is around trust in Bristol stories. Um, people believing that there is a unique voice and also us trying to find and discover that unique voice. And I know that, Michael, we've talked about some film projects, which I think 
would only work here in the same, same, in the same way that train spotting is a voice of a particular city and time. There is that thing around discovering a voice, being trusted to at least try and attempt and find out what that is. But also, in a sense, for commissioners, for funders, to, in a sense, not go for the stock idea. What's your big idea for your city? The bus boycott. Woo. You know, what's your, um, what's your national city? What's your national story? But actually trusting perhaps some of these local stories here of local interest are actually universal stories as well. And I wonder if one, sometimes that dissonance is part of the problem. Um, yeah, I think I think that's a that's that's a yeah very good point. I think especially a lot of kind of my role is thinking about like authentic portrayal because portrayal is good, but the authenticity behind it um, is also very important. Um, and I mean, at the moment where um, I think it's in post production, we're um, working on a kind of like six part series that follows a Bristol dance group as they're like defending their world championship. All right. So that in itself, that's very in terms of thinking about authentic <coughs> portrayal and a different and a different kind of story, because I understand what you mean, the Bristol bus boycott. Um, and that in itself, that's an important story to tell, but let's think about kind of like the nuances, the different ways, the, the different people in the community, in the city that are doing incredible things and making sure like we share those um, stories as well. So yeah, that's that's something that's in the works. Did you want to say anything, Natalie, do, uh, or do you think you've... Yeah, I, do, I, I completely agree. And it's something that's really high on our agenda, actually, as a city of film, is how we um, how we nurture those voices coming through, and how we make sure we we can we can identify authentic Bristol voices, and and nurture that talent through whether it's through schemes or whether it's whether it's setting up something completely new. You know, for the city. we don't have a writers' room in, in in Bristol. How do we make sure we have something similar to that in the city that we're, so we're able to find and identify the talent and then help them through? Um, telling, you know, we. Paul Holbrook is a, a filmmaker in Bristol who's doing great things on the festival circuit and um, a voice that we're we're really looking to support. And um, but you know he has his frustrations with the system as well. And, and with, in terms of how the, the city is um, not the city, but how, how the support he's able to access, I suppose, um, as a as a filmmaker. So it's how do we build those support systems to, to let those voices come through? I understand we've got room for one last question. Hello, I'm, I'm Charlotte, <coughs> Charlotte Crofts from UE Filmmaking and it's just to pick up on the point that Jeremy made and also the recommendation that Andrew Spicer made about the production fund, um, the business side of particularly drama production and also weaving in what the wildlife people were talking about like in-country or indigenous filmmaking but in Bristol filmmaking seemed to be a point that Natalie was making. So is there a way to bring those two things together with kind of financial investment not necessarily from big companies like Channel 4 and schemes like the BFI, but from financial investors who can see the benefit investing in the city. I don't really know what the answer is, but like, what can we do to make that production fund happen? Who do we need to be speaking to? Triodos Bank? Uh, I don't know. Was there, was there a quick intervention up there? And then, and then I will promise, Andrew, I'll... Maddie from Watershed and BFI Network. And just building on what's been said, we, we've been thinking about this idea of... A, a Bristol fund and we're in touch with the Liverpool fund mm -hmm. so uh, you'll be familiar with Chris um, or who used to be here so there's a lot of learning we can do from that um, which is a fund that invests in um, high-end television and also sneaks in some independent feature films as part of it and um, that investment in writers as well I've, we've had a chat with Chris and he was saying that's really key and I think we should really get behind that as a as a collective um, across different forms, whether that's immersive, um, documentary, feature films, to really start building up that um, writing um, capacity. But yeah, I think speaking to Liverpool, and they've got someone b based in the film office Thank that you. runs that. That's we're great to hear. Well, we're well connected to them, actually, Maddie. And, um, it's something that we are taking inspiration from all the time and actually had a conversation with a very senior councillor about, about it yesterday, but it's sort of getting it on the radar of the senior officers um, is something I'm trying to do. Thank you very much. Wonderful panel, inspiring panel. It's very exciting. Yes. I feel re-inspired to go and look at schemes again and ensure that's the circularity. Um, Andrew, are you going to introduce Edson? as well just stay on stage because it's just a short reading so final reading from our book Edson Burton thank you
probably had enough of me already. Incoherent questions at the front, sorry. <laughs> um, this is an extract from the book. Um, it's a wonderful read, um, and this is my contribution. There is a contribution by my daughter. No nepotism, honestly. Ticket stubs, brochures, and cookie crumbs. Cinema is my life's companion. Who I am, how I am, what I believe has been a dialogue with cinema. Of all our journeys together, parenthood has been the most redolent. Cinema provided reconnection and discovery. I had not seen an animation feature at the cinema since I was a child. Mr. Magoo and Bugs Bunny were inescapably part of my repertoire of cultural references. But I had subliminally associated animation with the stout legs of the black maid in Tom and Jerry. There was plenty of Snow White and nothing I realized on reflection for my black inner child. Returning to the cinema with my children, I was won over by, the th by 3D animation. Moreover, Pixar invested in storylines that recognized the sophistication of modern kids. Our children see us weep, argue, divorce, lie, and generally mess up. The flawed humanity on screen reflected our own story. My then partner and I separated before our children became teenagers. There were times when when film played out conversations that I did not know how to even start. For the most part, my inner critic was at pause, but occasionally thoughts would intrude. Does Will Smith's voice in Shark Tale or Eddie Murphy's in Shrek reinforce racial stereotypes? There is not word count enough to even consider my screaming disbelief at the anti-Semitic, anti-black grotesque of the Phantom Menace. On balance, the story arc, the little person coming good, trumped the racialized elements of, for which I could not find an easy language to explain to my then preteen offspring. You can imagine their eyes glazing over had I tried. I kept my disquiet to myself, conscious that we were still somewhat removed from finding black representation that I could wholeheartedly endorse. There was little else available. As a child, I was a comic book fan. Marvel over DC all day, every day. Thanks to CGI, I was able to share my childhood passion with my daughter and son. CGI made superhero movies possible. Heroes appeared to fly against real skies compared to the strings, reeks, and fake backdrops that I recalled in the 80s. The children adored Spider-Man, for whom Tobey Maguire was a perfect choice. I couldn't quite get past the notion of a flying spider in Lycra although much respect to the Shakespearean elements the writers brought to the franchise. I had no such scepticism when it came to the X-Men. Read as intended by the original comic book writers, X-Men dealt with US race relations with more nuance than many realist movies. We also had a kick-ass black heroine, Storm, played by Oscar winner Halle Berry. Of course, as Teenage, as teenage beckoned, the X-Men series also mirrored the outsiderness and identity crises that teenagehood is heir to. We grew up with these franchises. They changed as we changed as we grew older. Choosing what was viewed increasingly became a shared decision. I was not always in pole position. I had to sacrifice my socialist worker resentment of plummy posh kids, private schools and castles for the higher goal of seeing my children ride the roller coaster of the Harry Potter franchise. My daughter, remember sitting on my lap in terror in the closing scenes of the Chamber of Secrets. By the time we watched the final movie, part two of The Deathly Hallows, our roles were reversed. Like believing in Santa, we were all entertaining our inner child as the franchises that marked our lives came to the end of their generational cycle. In the final film, the Wolverine spin-off trilogy, a cracked, aging Logan and dying Professor Xavier, spoiler alert, sorry, sacrificed their lives to protect a new generation of mutants. Rated 15, the writers recognized the children of the first X-Men movie were young adults, open to more complex themes and references, and the adults that had accompanied them 15 years previously had moved much closer to their twilight. Our rituals changed as university grew near. Friends took priority, so we saw movies as and when we could, we couldn't always agree on film choices, and besides, my, my children sometimes required different conversations. Watching Juno at the cinema with my daughter was a rite of passage for us both. Likewise, watching 71 with my son affirmed our shared interest in smart action and smart social realism. 
my daughter, the eldest, was the first to depart for university. My incredibly loyal son eschewed his social circle to spend time with his old man. His commitments increased and staying across town was no longer vi viable, with early starts for rugby and or choir. Cinema gave us consistency and a space to commune without words. It also gave us moments of divine comedy. I assumed that the need for silence in a quiet place would kick in as the plot unraveled, which would then give us enough time to throw back the snacks. Wrong. And thus ensued an agonizing half hour of sucking Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Just before finishing off, Karen had a point that she needed to stress, so I've, I've invited Karen back up. I'm, I'm so sorry. It's very simple. Um, I forgot to bring you formal greetings. It's a kind of UNESCO thing, and they take it very seriously, and so I will be heartily told off if I forget to do this. Um, so I'm bringing you greetings from um, Alicia Herbert, who is the Head of International Education and the Acting Permanent Delegate for the UK's Foreign Common and Development Office to UNESCO. She's the most senior person we have in UNESCO at the moment. Um, and she's saying that she's absolutely delighted to learn about this event and she's seen the agenda and thinks it looks fantastic, as indeed it has been. Um, and she's saying congratulations. This has been echoed by James Bridge, who is the UK National Commission for UNESCO's Secretary General, so thank you very much. And sorry, Andrew. Thank you very much. It's always good to get formal greetings. Um, just a few final points. Uh, fantastic reading, Edson. Fantastic reading from all the readers. Do take a copy of the book if you haven't got it. Do take a copy and give to a friend uh, as well. Um, Mel, is there some other question you had? Oh, actually, you can take as many as you like then. But I do warn you, they're quite heavy. Um, as we've just discovered to our cost as they've arrived. So, um, so, yes, please do take as many as you like. We'll be following up some of the points that have been made today and we'll encourage others to follow through. We have a session tonight uh, on local impact capital, which is mainly things like housing and so on, but it, that might be a question to put to them about local production funds as well. What local funding could be developed there? And we'll certainly follow up on the Bristol Media Summit. There's a little group, I think, being established now to help take that forward. Thank you so much for coming and thank you most of all to our readers, our speakers, our chairs and our filmmakers. Thank you very much.